much like hope that it sends upon the wind, reaching out to every soul from a lowly manger's crib. is rolling down the rose. O rose of Bethlehem, O lovely, pure, and sweet, born to glorify the Father, born to All right, well, let's take our Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Kings, if you're able to stand for the reading of the Word of God. 1 Kings chapter 1. A, as we go through 1 Kings and 2 Kings, it's similar in, to the Samuels in the sense of there's a lot of, there's a lot of great practical truths, a lot, of, a lot of what I would almost call biblical psychology, dealing with the thinking of people, how to work with people, and, and the, the Word of God in these, kind of in these books of the Bible teaches so much um, about church life, family life, working with people. And tonight we're going to give you what I think are some real practical uh, principles from 1 Kings. So let's begin in chapter 1, verse 10. <clears throat> the Bible says this. But Nathan the prophet and Benaiah and the mighty men and Solomon his brother he called not. Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba the mother of Solomon saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah the son of Haggith doth reign? And David our Lord knoweth it not? Now therefore come, let me I pray thee give thee counsel that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go and get thee into the king, uh, into king, in unto king David, and say unto him, Didst thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, Surely Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? Why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy words. And Bathsheba went unto the king into the chamber, 
And the king was very old. And Abishag the Shunammite ministered unto the king. And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, What wouldest thou? And she said unto him, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto mine handmaid, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. And now, behold, Adonijah reigneth, and now, my lord the king, thou knowest it not. And he hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the sons of the king, and uh, Abiathar the priest, and Joab the captain of the host. But Solomon thy servant hath he not called. And thou, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it shall come to pass when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers, and I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. And lo, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in, and they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet, and when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? For he has gone down this day, and hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the king's sons and the captains of the host, and Abiathar the priest. And behold, they eat and drink before him and say, God save, uh, God save King Adonijah. But me, even thy servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon, hath he not called? Is this thing done by my lord the king? And thou hast not showed it unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? Then king David answered and said, Call me Bathsheba. And she came and stood into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king sware and said, As the Lord liveth that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by, uh, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead. Even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord King David live forever. And King David said, Call me Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. And they came before the king. And the king also said unto them, Take with you servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. And let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there king over Israel, and blow ye with the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. Then ye shall come up after him, that he may come and sit upon my throne. For he shall be king in my stead, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. And Benaiah the son of Jehoiada answered the king and said, Amen. The Lord God of my Lord the king say so too. As the Lord hath been with my Lord the king, even so be he with Solomon, and make his throne greater than the throne of my Lord King David. I'd like to preach on this subject tonight with the Lord's help. Helping an inactive leader. Helping an inactive leader. Let's pray. Father, bless now the preaching of your word. I pray uh, that you would help us, Lord, to, to see the applications of this text. And, and Lord, help us in our own life, whether we're a leader or, uh, or helping others who are leaders. I pray that you would give us wisdom and guidance in this matter. Bless the preaching of your word, we ask in Christ's name. All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. David's son, Adonijah, has determined to make himself king. He has also gathered one of David's key longtime generals in Joab and one of his key longtime priests in Abiathar. He has been parading through the city with the king's chariots and horses and 50 men at his side, uh, essentially uh, carrying himself in a procession 
of, of as the king of the area. People are noticing him and they are impressed. He is goodly. He is impressive. He is someone that, that naturally earns the favor of others. Now he has called a feast. And the princes and the elders and the servants, the key leaders of Judah, are all coming together to proclaim Adonijah as king. Even though Adonijah knows who God wants to be king. Even though Adonijah knows that God has selected Solomon to be king, he is usurping the will of God. He is usurping even the desire of his father. And he is promoting himself to be king over his father, even who's still king at this time, David. And the question, as you see this unfold in these verses, should be asked, what is King David doing? Because he's still king. And so as this is unfolding, what is the king doing about it? And here's the answer. Are you ready? Nothing. He is on the verge of dying. He has very little breath left in him. But he has not publicly declared that Solomon is to be the king. He has sworn unto Bathsheba. He has told Solomon this. But he has not declared openly or publicly that Solomon is God's choice. In addition, he's not made any moves. And in verse 6... We see this, the picture is, verse 5, it says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and 50 men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time in saying. Now here's the picture. It's, it's, it's referencing King David's past dealings with Adonijah. Why? Because it's telling you what, he, what he's going to continue to do. It's saying that while all this stuff is going on with Adonijah and he's seeking to usurp the throne, that David, his pattern has been due to guilt, due to, due, due to his age and all of these other factors, that, that his custom has been when it's come to Adonijah, he doesn't get involved. He doesn't reject, he doesn't rebuke him, he doesn't deal with him. His custom is basically to kind of let Adonijah do his thing. And the reason why the scripture is telling you that is this. It's saying that if everything continues as is, David isn't going to do anything. That Adonijah is going to run amok through the city and he's going to proclaim himself as king. And all of Israel is going to watch and David's just going to sit on the throne and allow it to unfold. The picture of verse 5 and verse 6 is this. That while all this stuff is unfolding, David has become an inactive leader. He is paralyzed. He is slowed. And he is not willing, or he is able, he is unwilling to deal with these issues. And the consequences are dire. We're talking about the kingdom of we're talking about the kingdom of Israel here. We're talking about the plan of God. We're talking about that God has made very clear to David who's supposed to be the king. David in his own heart knows who's supposed to be king. But if David does nothing because he's the one who's supposed to do something, if he does nothing, guess what's going to happen? Adonijah is going to become king. Solomon is going to have to go into hiding. And God's plan, no doubt, is still going to unfold, but it's going to be delayed and it's going to be chaos until it happens. The whole direction of the kingdom right here, right now, in this moment, could be derailed or delayed and a lot of innocent people will die. And while all this is happening, you have the people of verse 8. But Zadok the priest, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, not the same Shimei that we know of that, that, that threw rocks at David, a different Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men which belonged to David were not with Adonijah. And then you also have, in verse 11, you have some more people that are important. Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. So here's what you have. So you have Adonijah who's rising up against David, and Adonijah has Joab on his side, Abiathar on his side. He has the, many of the people of Judah on his side, which is very important. And, 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 and David is sitting there. He's, he's shivering. He's inactive. And when it comes to Adonijah, he's not really willing to do or wanting to do much. And imagine here you are, and you're Zadok, and you're Abiath, and you're, and you're the mighty men, and you're Nathan the prophet, and you're Solomon, 
and your Bathsheba. Now get this, and here you are, and you're not wanting your own agenda. You're wanting God's agenda. And you care about your king, and you care about the kingdom, and you want God's will to unfold, and here you are, and you have the right heart, you have the right desire, you want to see the right result, but you see what's happening, you see how it's all unfolding, and you're looking at your king, and he's doing nothing, and you know his pattern, what it's been over the decades, and what his pattern was with Absalom, and here you are, and you know what needs to happen, and you know what God wants to do, and you have the right intention, but you can't do anything about it. David's supporters find them in a challenging situation of not being the leader, but a leader under an inactive leader. And knowing that if David doesn't take action, massive consequences are going to follow. Okay. The hardest seat in the house sometimes is being a leader, but not the leader. It's being involved, invested, a part, and then watching the person above you sit or be seemingly inactive while everything's falling apart. To a wife, seeing the need for a husband to take action with finances or with children or with the spiritual direction of the house and see what's unfolding in the family and to sit there and be a leader but not be the leader and see the husband be completely inactive about it. To be your son or a daughter later in life to see their parents as they get older need to take action over their health, action over their possessions, action over their future, and to see them do none of those things and neglect their body and neglect their possessions and watch them begin to put themselves in a really bad position. To see a church leader need to take action with a sin or a conflict or a ministry that's falling apart or not going well and being a part of it and being invested and having served in it for years and watching it kind of just dissipate or, or to see a conflict and to see the conflict bubbling up and yet the leader isn't doing nothing about it. To see a pastor needing to take action over sin or staff or some issue in a church and understanding what's happening and how it's all unfolding and to see a pastor be completely inactive in it. To be a part of a work group, a department where the, where the numbers, where, 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 where all the things are saying something needs to change, something needs to happen, or this organization's not going to be around, and maybe to see the manager or the board or the very owner do nothing and realize that this business is about to tank. It is a very hard place to be a leader under the leader, and the leader is an inactive one at a time when activity is necessary. All of us will find ourselves in this position we will all find ourselves a part of a team, a part of a group, a part of a unit where, where there is conflict, there is chaos, there are issues, whether it's at a job, whether it's in a church, whether it's in a ministry, whatever, whether it's as a family, and there are things that are unfolding, and we have a seat at the table, and we're a part of what's happening, and whatever is happening impacts us, but we're not the one who gets to make the decision. We're not the one who gets to make the call, and we're seeing where the train is headed and we're saying, this is going to crash very bad. And to watch the person driving the train realizing they're asleep at, I know the train doesn't have a wheel, but they're asleep at the wheel, if I can combine some illustrations. It's very hard to be a leader under the leader who is inactive. And that's exactly where they are. That's where Nathan is. That's where the mighty men are. That's where Solomon is. So now here is Nathan, and Nathan sees all this stuff going on. But get this, Nathan understands that action needs to be taken. But, but what kind of action? For himself to jump in and to take over and to start to, to kind of assert David and to start making decisions and to make calls? Nope. David knows, Nathan knows as a prophet that something needs to happen but get this, Nathan never resorts to making himself the answer. He never resorts to becoming, to usurping, replacing, or, over, or overpowering the leader. Do you know what Nathan's going to choose to do? He's going to choose to come alongside 
and help the leader. That's very good. Nathan is watching his king go through all this stuff, and Nathan knows something needs to, be, needs to happen, but Nathan doesn't say, I'm just going to take over and I'm going to do the thing. Here's what Nathan says. Nathan looks at the, at the leaders and says, here's what we need to do. We need to come alongside and help our inactive leader become active. Sometimes we find ourselves in situations in a marriage, in a ministry, in a collective, in a family, where there is a leader that is inactive and we know if this isn't, this isn't us wanting someone to be like us, do what we want to do, this is something that's important, it's significant, and we know that action needs to be taken. And in our flesh, we desire to kind of just take over and to usurp and to make it happen. But what we see here is the biblical pattern, the godly pattern, is not to try to replace the leader, it's to try to help the leader. It's to come alongside. Listen, it, the, the answer is not to replace your spouse. The answer is not to overrun your spouse. The answer is not to overrun that ministry leader or to ignore that ministry leader. The answer is not to, to you know, overrun the boss or to overrun the manager. Here's what the answer is. The answer is to exercise biblical wisdom in coming alongside and helping that leader to become more active. Now, one thing I do, there is a qualifier here. Because I want, you to, I, want to, I want to just remind you of this, that Nathan and these people have seen a lot of stuff, but they've never jumped in before. Why are you pointing this out? Because it's not like Nathan and, and these, these supporters, just every time David does something that they don't agree with, or every time David isn't as active as they want to be, they just feel the need to jump in. This is serious. This is significant. Like this is something that's emergency 911 has to happen. And I think one of the reasons why Nathan is effective and Bathsheba is going to be effective here is because they weren't just always randomly, quickly interjecting, trying to correct David, but that they were sparing about it. And thus, when they really needed to do it, it carried more weight. You see, there are some people that are all about helping the leader. The problem is they're trying to help the leader lead like they would lead. And so every time a leader doesn't act here or doesn't do this, it's like, well, we need to help the leader. But what you're really saying is you want to be the leader. And that if you overplay helping the leader, here's what you're going to do. You're going to lose leverage. In a marriage, can I just, can I just, can I just help? Listen, if you're, a, if you're a husband and your wife isn't where she needs to be spiritually or vice versa, can I just tell you this? That you need to be very mindful and very sparing about how much you're trying to, to direct and how much you're trying to infuse activity in your spouse because every time you're doing that it's like a withdrawal and the more you do it the less leverage you're going to have so you need to be wise about how often you do that and with the leader if every time a ministry leader does something that you think they need to do this or that and you're constantly bombarding them with that they're eventually going to drown you out so so they were they were very sparing about it but another thing that we're going to see and this is really what I want to hone in on is that Nathan understands this, now catch this, that there's one thing worse than an inactive leader, it's a defensive leader. And Nathan understands that if they don't approach David correctly, he's going to go from being inactive to defensive. In inactive... He's able to be encouraged. In inactive, he's able to be influenced. In inactive, he's able to be helped. But once David shifts to defensive, it's over. And so Nathan isn't just going to roll in there and just say what he needs to say. Why? Because he wants to be careful that he doesn't turn an inactive leader into a defensive leader. When, when you and I are dealing with someone who's in leadership and we're trying to help someone maybe towards an action or trying to deal with an issue... The most important thing you need to understand is that there's one step worse than having them be inactive. It's them being defensive. Once they are defensive, you've completely lost the ability to influence them. From the text, you're going to see this as we see what they do. There are some things that Nathan knew caused defensiveness in leaders. Let me give you, let me give you a list of things that cause defensiveness in leaders that, that, we're going to, that Nathan's going to work around. The first one is this personal attack. If this conversation that Nathan wants to have with David becomes about him not being a good dad, 
or it, it becomes about him neglecting his role as a father, it's probably going to make David defensive. If they go in there and they attack David as a person and his motive and why he's inactive or why he's not doing anything, understand this, that David's probably not going to listen to what they have to say. One of the dangers that we can have when we go to someone that we're trying to help, that we're trying to encourage, is that we can make it a personal attack. And when you and I personally attack someone, their motives or, or why they're doing what they're doing or, or, or their pattern, when we attack people personally, here's what happens. They get defensive. If you compare them to other people, they're likely to get defensive. If you accuse them of being simply lazy or they just don't care or they don't really love their kids or they don't really care about the company or they just want a retirement or whatever. You start attacking people, you accuse them. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to make them defensive. If you belittle them, you, you take their leadership, you take their decisions and you start mocking it or you start speaking about how foolish they are, how they don't know what they're doing and you start belittling them, understand this, you're going to make them defensive and now you've lost any ability to help an inactive leader. The second thing that he knew that they needed to avoid, that you're going to see them avoid, is this. The feeling of being ganged up on. Um, you know, David, there's a lot of leaders here concerned. But what happens if all they, they all come in at once? And they're all saying the same thing. And they're all telling him he needs to do this and he's not doing that. Uh, you know what it would probably feel like to a king? A little bit of a conspiracy. Come on, here you are. And it's not like David doesn't know some stuff about conspiracies. And so imagine all of a sudden you've got a general there, you've got a prophet there, you've got mighty men there, and they're all saying the same thing. Like they've sat around the table and they've all communicated the same words. And now here you are, you're the king, you're in your latter years, you've been dealing with all kinds of upheavals, and it would be very easy for you to feel ganged up on and to feel like, man, this is a conspiracy. You're, you're talking about Adonijah, I've got a conspiracy right here. And immediately to get defensive. When you and I deal with leaders, sometimes there's, there, may be, there might be one or two of us and we need to talk to a leader, but here's what we always have to avoid. You want to avoid ever making it look like it's us versus you. Did you hear that? You, you don't want to come in to a meeting with someone and it's like there's been all these meetings, there's been all these discussions, and now it's us against you. You're the problem and we've all come in as a collective to help you. Mark it down. When you do that, they feel ganged up on and they're going to shut you out. The third thing he's gonna, that he's going to try to avoid is the feeling of being manipulated. You know, as a king, think about how many people have agendas. You know, how many people bow, give them all this fluffy, my lord, the king stuff. And, they're at the, and it's almost like David could be like, okay, just tell me what you want. How many counselors did he have? How many leaders did he have that were simply using him for their own desires and their own goals? And so as, as Bathsheba would come or as Nathan would come, one of the things that David would need to know is that they're not just wanting to use David for their own desires, but they really care about David and what God wants for David. One of the worst feelings in leadership is this, to be manipulated. Am, am I right? In any, not just leadership, in life. There's something very, there's something very painful and, 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 and very hard about having someone in your life that you think is using you for their own desire. Someone who's nice to you, someone who's polite to you, someone who's respectful to you, but they're just doing that to get something out of you. And when someone begins to sense you're manipulating them and you're, you know, you're applying some tactic, you learn some bullet point thing online or you got some little fresh little outline in Sunday school and you're just using it to move them like they're a control and you're just put, no, no, when people sense that, they're going to get defensive. They don't, nobody wants to be manipulated. No one wants to be forced. You know, Nathan could go in there and tell, tell David, he's a man of God, he's got some authority, but you know, you know someone who loved to try to force David was Joab. And Joab is now on the other side, rising up against him. Imagine if Nathan went in there and tried to command him or tried to put pressure on him. You know, I could see David feeling like here he is all over again dealing with a Joab and shutting him off. 
in a marriage in particular, we have to be careful about trying to force our spouse to be the kind of leader that we want them to be. Please hear this. This, is good mar- this isn't a marriage sermon, but this is good marriage counseling right here. That in a marriage, sometimes in a spouse, you're going to see, especially with a husband, you know, there's all these books out there that tell you what a husband ought to be. Can I just tell you that a lot of those books were, were, were not written with reality in mind. And sometimes I read one of these marriage books and I'll hear someone say, well, my husband needs to be all these things. I'm like, do you know who you married? Because that's not at all the kind of person that they are. And I'm not talking about spiritual stuff. I'm talking about levels of sensitivity and communication that you're going to have to go hang out with Dr. Phil or something. You're not getting that from the average person. And, and so, so what happens is we get all this stuff in our mind and we want their, our, our spouse to be this kind of mom or this kind of dad. And we just start bull rushing people to make them be that. Or we get in our job and we think our manager ought to be this or our boss ought to be this or our, or our Sunday school teacher ought to be this or the parent who teaches our kids ought to be this kind of Sunday school teacher. And I'm just telling you, you start, bull, you start bulldozing people and pushing people. You're going to make them defensive. You're not going to help them. And then the last one would be this is misled. You know, they're going to come in there and they're going to tell David about what Adonijah is doing. But remember this, David has had stuff like this happen to him before. Do you remember when someone told him about Mephibosheth? And David said, well, what's, where's Mephibosheth? And Ziba gives him this whole story. And, what, and then what did David do? David acted upon all that information. You know what he found out later on? He was completely misled by Ziba and Ziba completely lied to him. And so one of the things that we have to be careful about is that this, when we go to someone, people want good information. They want to know that what you're saying isn't just opinion or it isn't just, you know, you, know, you think you know what's happening. You, people, pe- if people feel like you don't know what you're talking about, they're going to stop listening to you. So when, when you're approaching someone that you're trying to help towards activity, you need to think about this, that there's a lot of ways that you can have walls built up. If they feel ganged up on, if they feel forced, if they feel manipulated, if they feel like you don't really know what you're talking about, there's all these different things. And here's what's amazing, that Nathan understood all this intuitively. And so Nathan is going to begin to work to help his leader. And here's the first thing I want you to notice in verse 11. The Bible says this, Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee, what's the next word? Counsel, that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go and get thee in unto King David and say unto him, Didst thou, didst not thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? Why then, Ad, why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy words. So now I want you to get this before the conversation is ever going to unfold. It starts off with Nathan talking to Bathsheba saying, Now listen, we need to make sure that we go in at this, we need to go in this the right way. And he gives her counsel. You know what the implication is of this? It's this, that he thought about the conversation before he had it. That, that he didn't just say, oh, oh man, oh, this is all bad. I'm going to go in there and I'm going to tell King David. No, no, he sat back and he thought about, okay, I'm about to go in and have this meeting with the king how do we need to go about doing this? Um, counsel means advice. I love this. An opinion given based on deliberation or consultation. Counsel is something that is given based upon deliberation or consultation. It requires thought. It requires taking time to think through, how do I go about this? What do I do here? I think one of the most important things when, when you see inactivity in, in, in a leader and you want to help somebody, you need to be careful about just shooting off an email or just texting them or getting on a phone or just waltzing into their office or just off the cuff saying what you feel. Because if you really want to be effective and you really want to help somebody, you have to understand that what you're about to say, please hear this, what you're about to say not only A, can make them defensive, but B, can hurt your relationship for a long time. 
And if you're, if you're taking it seriously, and, if, and by the way, and if what's happening is such a serious thing, then you and I should be willing to take some time to think about it before we just go in there without really having anything thought about. If it's as serious, if it really needs to be talked about, if it's at that high of a level, then it was worthy of the time to think about, okay, now what, what do I not say? How should I go about this? And I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm not talking about stroking someone's ego. I'm just talking about understanding, you know, how you're going to go and how you're going to present something to allow someone to take the information and to be a help to them. So they're going to approach. So Nathan says to Bathsheba, you're going to go in first and then I'm going to come in and then we're going to talk to King David. So I want you to notice as they approach him some some important things that, that kind of manifest in their approach. Verse 15. And Bathsheba went in unto the king into the chamber and the king was very old and Abishag the Shumanite ministered unto the king. Right about there, if I were Bathsheba, I'd have a hard time saying anything good. But anyway, verse 16, And Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance unto the king. And the king said, What wouldest thou? And she said unto him, Notice how she starts, My lord, thou swearest by the Lord thy God unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne. Now, now Bathsheba comes in there, and here's where she starts off. With his, his plan and the desire that he personally spoke about. She comes in there and she says, listen, king, you have said to me that this is what you desire. That this is where you want the kingdom to go. Now, yes, is it, is it good for her that this is the case? Yes, but she is starting off with the whole premise of, I care about what you want. I care about what, how God has spoken to you. I'm not just coming in here with my list and my desires. I'm starting off recognizing this. You're a leader and you have desires and you have a plan. And I care about those. And it's a matter of fact, it's your plan that I'm coming to talk to you about. The first thing she does is she affirms his desire and his plan. She affirms his leadership. Um. You know, a lot of times when, when you come into a leader, instead of starting off with all the negative and giving your list of what you think, whether it's in a marriage or, or a job or a ministry, you know what it's good to start with? Recognize their position and recognize who they are as a leader. You know, here, you know, I know that I know that as a husband or I I know that you're you know, I know that you, you want to live for the Lord, and I know that you want to be a good husband, and I know that you're striving to lead our children. And, and I mean, and I'm not talking about lying. I'm just talking about identifying the, the passions and the desires that you know that they have. You know, here you are, you're a boss. I mean, I know you got all these things going on. I know that you're trying to get these numbers up, and I know you're, and I'm not talking about buttering up. I'm just affirming the realities of people that are there. So that when, when the person, when you're coming to the person, they know that you actually affirm that they're a leader and that you actually are even aware of what they care about or what they're trying to do. Then she does this, verse 18. And now behold, Adonijah reigneth, and now my lord the king, thou knowest it not. And he hath slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the sons of the king, and Abiathar are the priest, and Joab the captain of the host. But Solomon thy servant hath he not called. And thou, my lord, O king, the eyes of all Israel are upon thee, that thou shouldest tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. So here's what I want you to get. She tells him, she lays out the problem as a fact, not as an attack. She just tells him what's going on without saying, yeah, that, that spoiled son of yours. You know, the boy that you've never corrected once in your life, he's back at it again. None of that. Do you notice that nothing she says here? Matter of fact, she says he knows it not. He knows it not. I, I don't know that he knows it not. But, but they're, they're believing he knows it not. And she's coming to him saying, I, I want to make you aware Of a problem. Get it? She's not saying you're the problem. One of the the biggest 
One of the biggest ways we lose people when we're trying to help them and we're trying to move leaders is this. We make the leader the problem, not the problem. And when we attack them and we attach their failures or their faults to what the problem is, here's what you're going to get. A wall. And she's just saying, I just want you to know about this. I don't think you know. I'm just telling you what's going on. Then verse 21, otherwise it shall come to pass when my Lord the King shall sleep with his fathers that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. And then here's what she is. She's honest about her concern. She doesn't just tell him and then leave it with him. And she says, and here's what I'm afraid of. Get this. Here's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that once Adonijah rules, he's going to come after me and he's going to come after Solomon because he knows that we believe he should be the king and he's going to accuse us of treason and he's going to seek to take our life. And so she's being open. She's being transparent. She's saying she's not attacking him. She's not saying this is his fault. She's just saying this is what I'm concerned about. This is what I'm afraid is going to happen. And then she says this in verse 18. And she says this, this is important. And behold, Adonijah reigneth now, my lord the king, thou knowest it not. Now here's what I want you to get. She never tells him what to do. You know what she does? She makes him aware of the problem. She tells him her concerns. And then you know what she does? She leaves it in his hands. In other words, she defers to his position and his judgment and she she gives him the room to feel, mm, she gives him the room to feel like he can make the decision. Then, as that's happening, verse 22, and lo, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet also came in. And they told the king, saying, behold, Nathan the prophet... And when he was come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. And Nathan said, My lord, O king, hast thou said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne? For he has gone down this day and slain oxen and fat cattle and sheep in abundance, and hath called all the king's sons and the captains of the host. And Abiathar the are the priest, and behold, they eat and drink before him, saying, God save king Adonijah, but me, even my servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and thy servant Solomon hath he not called. Now look at this. Is this thing done by my lord the king? And thou hast not showed it, to unto, uh, showed it unto thy servant, who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? So now, I love this. The first thing that they're doing is they don't come in right at once. One, to dispel the feeling of being ganged up on. It's not like, boom, it's all happening at one time. It's okay, Bathsheba comes, and then... And now Nathan's going to come after the first word. The second dynamic is this, is that Bathsheba tells a story and Nathan tells the exact same story. Why is that important? Because it's, it's, it's telling David that this isn't misinformation. This isn't just a fearful Bathsheba overreacting to a rebellious Adonijah. But he's getting, get this, he's getting two separate accounts So that he's realizing this isn't just hearsay. This isn't just somebody overreacting. This is really happening. So it's it's making him realize this is fact. Then at the end, I love what he says in verse 27. When he says, is this thing done by my Lord the King and thou hast not showed unto thy servant? In other words, here's what he's saying. Is this what you want? Because if this is what you want, we're going to follow you. Now, now, everyone in the room knows that's not what's supposed to happen. But here's what he's doing. He's pointing out the problem, and then he's once again leaving it in his hands to make the decision. Now, there's some really, there's some really practical principles here about helping an inactive leader when we put it together. Here's the first one. Affirm support and desire to help them achieve their goals. Look. A leader has been given that position to achieve goals. And if you go to a leader, you go to someone in a position and it's all about your goals and your desires, why, why would a leader listen to you? And honestly, if you don't care about what their goals are and you don't care what their desires are, I'm not sure they li- should listen to you because you may not really know what's right. 
So when you come to a leader, you got to affirm, look, I, I, I know that this is what you're trying to accomplish. I know this is where you're trying to head. I know these are the goals that you have, and I'm with you, and I'm for you, and I want to help see these things be achieved. Number two, state the problem without making it personal. It's so important that when you highlight something that's wrong, that you don't attack the individual in the process. Thirdly, be transparent about your fears and concerns. You, you, listen, you don't have to say, you're running this ship into the ground, you're destroying it. How about this? Look, I'm concerned that if we continue at this stage, this is what's going to happen. Do you see the difference there? You're running this ministry into the dirt. You keep going at it this way, we're not even going to have anybody in this ministry. Okay, that's one way of going about it. What about this? You know, I'm just nervous that if we keep going this way, that these kinds of things could happen. Totally different. Totally different mindset. You know, I'm afraid that if, you know, if, if our son, if you never say anything, to, you know, if we, never, if we never talk to our son about these things, and maybe someone else will, and they may lead him this way. I don't know what you think, but I'm concerned about this. Transparency, honesty. Fourth, have good information. Let me just tell you this, the whole, like, I've, you know, I've talked to a bunch of people. By the way, if you do that with me, I'm usually going to say, how many? You know, like, man, I've been, there have been a lot of people talking to me, pastor. That's usually like your wife. <laughs> Come on, I know how this goes. Oh, oh, pastor, I'm just really, man, there's a lot of people. Like, okay, like two? That's, I'm, I'm just telling you, I've been doing this long. That's usually what it is. Have good information. Don't exaggerate. Tell, tell what you know. And make sure that what you're saying is, is accurate. Make sure it's not inflated. Make sure it's not emotional. Make sure that you're not overblowing it. Have good information. If you need another voice, do it carefully and maybe even individually. Look, there are times when there's multiple people and, and, and they need to hear multiple people. But sometimes it might be good for you to talk to them and then the other person to talk to them individually and then maybe come together collectively. You want to be very careful about dealing with someone in a way where they feel like they're being ganged up on. Then I think one of the most important things is to leave it with the leader to make the decision. When, when you tell someone, hey, look, I'm, I'm, this is what I see. This is what's going on. Th I'm really concerned about this. I'm really, I'm really worried about this. But, but here's the thing. I just want to tell you, I wanna, I'm going to pray for you. If you need me, if you want to do it, I'm here for you. But I'm just putting this, I'm putting this in your hands. When you do that, here's what you're doing. You're giving them the room to not feel pressure, to not feel forced, and to be able to change their direction without feeling like they're being pushed to change their direction. You know, people really will make decisions a lot more if they feel like they actually get to be the one to make the decision. And so you say, this is, I just want to leave this with you. So that's what Nathan does. They come in. They, Bathsheba comes. She tells the story. And she affirms the desire and goes to the account. And then, and then Nathan comes in and he says what he has to see. Now look at the response in verse 28. Now remember who we're talking about, right? We're talking about the king who was sitting on his throne, shivering. They're putting blankets on him. They've got a lady there as a caregiver. And now, now think about all that. Now watch verse 28. Then King David answered and said, call me Bathsheba. And she came into the king's presence and stood before the king. And the king swore and said, okay, now, 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 now keep this in mind. This is the same, the same king we just looked at two chapters, or two sermons ago. As the Lord liveth that hath redeemed my soul out of all distress, even as I swear unto thee by the Lord thy God, uh, by the Lord thy God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon thy son shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth and did reverence to the king and said, Let my lord the king David live forever. And the king said, Call me Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet and Benaiah the son of Jehoda. And they came before the king. The king also said unto them, Take with you the servants of your Lord and cause Solomon my son to ride upon my own mule and bring him down to Gihon and let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there king over Israel. Blow ye with the trumpet and say, God save King Solomon. Whoa! Sitting there. 
No, listen. Inactive. Kingdom falling apart. He's approached correctly. You know what happens? He sees it. He sees it. And here's what he realizes. He, he realizes without them saying it, he realizes by their approach, he has to do something. And in this state, it's like he gets a burst that you don't see coming. Now understand this. And as he's saying, go get my mule. And go get Solomon. And go get Nathan. And get Jehoiada. Now listen, as he's saying, and anoint him, do you know what he's also saying? He knows what's going to happen with Adonijah now too. He's declaring Adonijah to be treasonous. He is taking a hard line stance against his own son that he has never taken. And he is showing this assertiveness and this authority. And then he's saying this, and once you've done it, I'm going to get off my throne. Give him the throne. Wow. Wow. You, you, you read those first few verses of chapter 1 and you don't see that coming. And I think one of the points there is this, is that leaders often have more in them than we give them credit for. You know, sometimes we see leaders, we see people in, in church ministry or in family and we, we get so down on people in, who are inactive and we get so hard on people, we don't even see or believe that they can ever be that or do that or achieve that. But here's what's amazing. When they, came, when they came and they helped him and they encouraged him in the right way, David showed a leadership and an assertiveness and a decision making and a, and a willing to confront an issue that he hadn't shown for a long time. And what you see is even in his last gasps, he had more leadership in him than probably anyone would have given him credit for. You know, sometimes... There, can I just say this? There's more often in your spouse than you realize. Come on. There's often more in your boss or your manager than you realize. There's often more in that ministry leader than you realize. That sometimes we, we, we get to the place where it's hopeless, they're never going to achieve, they're never going to do this, and we write them off. But you know what? If we would just learn how to be wise, if we would just learn how to come alongside of people and encourage them and approach them, you might just be surprised at the burst. You might just be surprised at the motivation. You might just be surprised how that humility and that support and how that rallying around and how that consideration and leaving it in their hand, you might, not always, but a lot of times you might just be surprised at how God might bring about a burst of leadership that you never saw that might be there. And here in this critical moment where this inactive leader needed to make swift, precise, hard decisions, they came alongside and they prevented him from getting defensive. And as a result, Solomon is about to become king and the kingdom's about to roll again. Here's the statement. A wise supporter can help a leader become active without making him become defensive. A wise supporter can help a leader become active without making him become defensive. I want to encourage you tonight. I want you to, first of all, evaluate if there's an area of inactivity in your leadership. You know, it would be easy to get in the car Listen, it would be easy to get in the car, husbands. It would be easy to get in the car, ministry leader. It would be easy to get in the car as a, as, a minist- as a leader in your organization and say, that's right, I just need better supporters. Well, you need to ask this question. Maybe do you need to be more active? Is there some areas where you're, you're, you're flagrantly not doing the things that you should be doing. And as a result, there's some, Aden- there's some Adonijahs in your home. There's some Adonijahs, there's some uprisings, there's some significant issues unfolding simply because you won't do the things. I'm not talking about crazy things, the things that you know that you're supposed to do as a leader. You know, every leader, every person should ask themselves, is there areas of inactivity in me? Number two, be sparing and sure about when and how to help a leader. Don't make it your your dream and ambition to always make someone take the action that you need to make. Make sure that when it's time, it's really the right issue and the right time to help them. Or you're going to end up having a time when you really need to encourage them and you've blown it before. 
And then thirdly, and this, is, this is something I want to bring together. Remember that the leader and the helper are all on the same team. We're all, listen, we're all together. Whether, whether a person has a title, whether a person is the leader, a leader, whether a person is helping the leader, whether a leader is trying to help those, we are, all, we are all working together in our families. Listen, husbands and wives, you are on the same team. You are not enemies. You are not competing. You are together trying to have a family for the glory of God. In a business, you are working together to see that business go forward. In a ministry, in a church, listen, we are all on the same team. And we are all trying to see souls saved, souls baptized, souls added, souls discipled, and to see God do a great work in our church. And so as we're moving ahead, we always need to remember this, that there's no enemies, there's no adversaries. We're working together to see God's will achieved. And as we do, always remember this, a wise supporter can help a leader become active without making him become defensive. May God help us to have active leaders and wise supporters. Father, we thank you for your word tonight. So much practical truth here. So much practical truth. And I pray that you would help us, Lord, to understand that wherever we are, it may be in one area of life, we are the leader. And I pray that you would help us to evaluate our activity and even how we allow people to help us. Maybe in another area, we're under someone or helping someone. Help us, Lord, to evaluate whether we're being wise and how we're approaching situations. Maybe right now, someone tonight is in a serious situation and they're thinking, how can we move this forward? I pray you'd give them the wisdom of a Nathan. Help them to have the approach of a Bathsheba. and Bring us forward for your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name.